Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much for everyone for coming coming by. Uh, as uh, it's a really ex it's a very exciting time for everybody uh, everybody in the space. And uh, let's see. Yeah. Cool. And so uh, I'm Nicole uh, Lazaro. For those of you who I haven't met, and uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, virtual reality and some design five design strategies that we've developed uh, over the course of the past year where we've been doing uh, actual research on people playing VR experiences, uh, from Google Cardboard to uh, Oculus uh, to uh, you know, some, other, some other, other platforms. So, so virtual reality, yeah. Uh, so from the, from the dawn of time, you know, games have always created it. It's this magic circle where we transport our players for a few minutes, a few hours, a uh, few days, and even a few years. With uh, today's new virtual reality headsets and AR smart glasses that we've been playing with at the studio, uh, we finally reached this intersection of movie-like immersion on one hand and gameplay autonomy and action, you know, actionability on the, on the other. And um, uh, on one hand, virtual reality offers this unprecedented theater, seriously, an unprecedented theater for engagement. But virtual reality also has uh, an unprecedented amount of, it faces a number of obstacles, an unprecedented amount of psychological, physiological, gameplay, and other obstacles uh, that other platform shifts in games long illustrious history for the past 30 to 40 years. If you combine all of those together, uh, combined, virtual reality has is, is got that much uh, going against it right, right now. So this talk is going to present uh, five of what we think are uh, some of the more important uh, VR strategies for creating really comfortable, uh, uh, really comfortable and fun and successful VR, uh, VR experiences. So uh, that, that's going to be fun. A little bit about me really quickly so you know where I'm coming from. I, I am uh, basically a, a game developer, designer. I'm a consultant, so I basically make things fun for a, a living. <laughs> I have a degree in Stanford, uh, from Stanford on the psycholo in psychology, cognitive psychology, how people think, learn, and remember. I'm also a, a programmer uh, and a filmmaker. Uh, I love design innovation, and I'm also uh, an analyst. Uh, to put it a little bit more succinctly, uh, what it is that I bring to the table is, for 22 years, I've been working with the major studios uh, in the game industry and outside of games and asked this one question, which is, where is the fun? <laughs> okay, that, that is essentially the one question that we, that we answer. And to get at that, I did, about 10 years ago, a uh, number of some seminal research on uh, emotion in gaming. So I measured the emotion on people's faces while they played games, hundreds of emotions, and created a, uh, a model called the Four Keys to Fun, uh, based on those, that experiences, those experiences. And it turns out that players play games for four reasons. Novelty, they play for challenge, they play for friendship, and they play for meaning. By and large, those are the big, the big buckets. And each of these buckets, uh, which we call a key, uh, creates an interesting, different experience. Best-selling games tend to have three out of the four experiences, uh, play styles in them, and then players tend to move between three out of the four in a single player session. Each leaf on this, this four-leaf clover uh, has a different set of emotions and a different set of mechanics. So we organized those emotions by, uh, into common clusters, and then we looked at what mechanics were in each one. There's a lot of stuff like this on the net. You can look at some of my other talks. Feel free to come up afterwards if you want more about the, the four keys. A couple of other points uh, that we should bring up is that what I did is I used this four keys. It's a practical model. I used it to design the very first iPhone game. So a week after the iPhone came out, I teamed up with Joe Hewitt at iPhone Dev Camp, and we created a game called Tilt, a JavaScript game. Uh, we've since built on it to create this larger game, which is called Tilt World. And uh, you use the points now not just to earn points, but you actually plant trees on the island of Madagascar. So players have planted 16,000 trees uh, using a game. We also have a game in development now called Lux. It's a game about forgiveness. But more relevant for today's topic is we have a game uh, that we just did for the Oculus Game Jam uh, called Follow the White Rabbit. And uh, in Follow the White Rabbit, it's a virtual reality game, plays on uh, the uh, Oculus uh, Gear VR headset. 
uh, Samsung Gear VR headset. And what it is, is you, you basically, it's a game about a magician who has been a charlatan all his life until one day his magic actually works. The rabbit goes into the hat, but does not come back out. And uh, which would be all right, except it was wearing at the time of its disappearance a priceless diamond bracelet. So now everybody wants to follow the white rabbit. Uh, let, me, let me show you a quick, uh, quick teaser on this. Can we bring the volume up just a little bit? So that's a little peek at Follow the White Rabbit. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so we're really excited at the studio about, uh, about, about Follow the White Rabbit. Zeoplay is our uh, you know, consumer brand for, uh, for game experiences. Uh, and what it did is it taught us a wonderful thing as you know, the lead engineer and the game designer, Brandon Jones is the artist on Follow the White Rabbit, is that it's this wonderful, VR is this wonderful opportunity. If you can imagine a virtual world where you, the creator, have complete control uh, and the player literally does enter, you know, your, the, the, the world that you, that you imagine. And, uh, and that you have this direct access to, to their emotions. That's the promise. That's where we're going. That's what is uh, amazing about some of, these, uh, some of these headsets and some of these experiences. And today's VR headsets are really good enough to be at that intersection between movie-like immersion and compelling interactive uh, agencies of games. In fact, you know, VR really, I like to think of it as an empathy machine. Now we believe that this is, hap that this is true, that, uh, that we believe that the emotional qualities of VR is going to exceed the emotional qualities of film, and it's also going to exceed the emotional qualities of games, and here's why. On the, on the vertical axis, we think of immersion, like Birth of a Nation, going to Schindler's List to say a movie like Inception increasing levels of immersion as, as Hollywood gets better and better at telling, at telling visual stories, linear stories. On interaction, we get, and games get better and better and better. Here's just a few of many games that I, that I particularly like. Uh, you know, Halo, Mass Effect, Bioshock, lots of really interesting stuff. And we see an increase of emotion along both of these axes. And where I feel VR sits is here in the, in the upper right where VR is this intersection between the movie-making talents to move people emotionally and the agency talents that we have uh, and the ability to create emotion through interaction that game designers have. So it's going to be this amazing experience uh, once we figure it out, once we figure out how to, how to deliver it. So that's why I'm here today is I'm going to, we've, we've been, as I said, we've done research for the past year. We're going to, ex we've extracted out some, uh, some great best practices uh, to get this at this uh, unprecedented level of um, immersion and presence. I thought this was interesting. This is from E3. They're measuring my inner pupil distance for the Halo lens uh, or the HoloLens uh, demo. And so the length at which we have to like uh, go through the hardware to, in order to get a good experience is pretty, is pretty uh, foreboding <laughs> in a lot of cases. Uh, and I think that the other, so the assumption that we're looking at to start with is that most people assume that the language of cinema, on one hand, and, the tr and that traditional game mechanics, tropes they port well into VR, but really nothing can be further from the truth. The second problem we have is we don't have existing ports. We also have this other problem of being, if we have to innovate new tropes, new ways of doing things, it's really tough because of this one, one rule, is that, this is from a DARPA study, that 70%, 70%, of your um, uh, project costs are really locked in early design. And uh, you basically have to make these decisions before you know what the fun really is. 
So that's where these uh, design strategies can come in as a tool. Let's develop some design tools to help us during early design to try out more ideas, be more assured about where we're going, you know, what, what the effect is. And so here are 36 uh, design, uh, design strategies that we're, that we're using. Uh, and we are going to be coming, we've come up with these 36 based on our year of research. And we've watched people play based on hundreds of different uh, experiences. We're going to cover uh, five, these five of them today. Okay, and uh, that uh, we're going to start with uh, the first one, which is uh, the, the audience. So number one, so this is an interesting problem as well because we want to match for audience. We want to one, we want to match player expectations and what current VR hardware can deliver. So if you think about traditional hardcore, you know, game genres, when we ask people, what do you want to play? Oh, I want to play Call of Duty in VR. I want to play Grand Theft Auto in VR. I want to play, you know, the people that we've trained to, to spend 500, 300, 1,000 dollars on a gaming console, they want to play these hardcore games, right? That's what players want. On the other hand, what VR can deliver is something uh, quite, what VR does well is something quite, uh, quite different, okay? It's this, uh, and it's the intersection that we're going to have to find. That's where these successful experiences are going, are going to be. And so it's that, um, that, that sweet spot. Now we do have a range of devices. So I see, you know, we've got the head mounted display to Google, uh, say to a Google Cardboard. So that's going to help the situation quite a bit. The other thing that's going to be in our favor, especially with the people in this room here, is that casual games, the mechanics we find in the, in the casual game community are much more VR friendly than a lot of the ones in, um, uh, in the hardcore, more hardcore space. So it's this sort of sweet spot uh, overlapping what players want and what VR, VR does well. So that's the uh, matching player expectations to the hardware. The second one is to deliver comfort. We hear a lot about comfort. And uh, with hardcore uh, gaming mechanics, which are awesome, they're amazing games, but they often are, create tension with fast motion, precise tracking, 3D navigation, and there's a real recipe to create you know, a barfatorium if you try and do it in, in VR, right? Uh, so there's this other, we have to find other ways, maybe those same situations, but other mechanics, other ways of moving through those environments in order to make these, uh, these work. Because we can't do fast turns around a point, we can't run at 40 miles an hour like you do in Call of Duty, and we can't do stairs very well in VR. Stairs are kind of tough in VR. And when we don't do this right, when we uh, don't deliver comfort, uh, it's really bad because people will rip the, the headset off and they will throw it away. And he says, I never want to do this again. It's way more expensive, you know, it's way more involved and I really feel horrible. And when they, once they've done that, they, you know, they don't want to come back, right? They don't want to come back. Uh, another wrinkle on this, so this is about disgust, and disgust is also simulator sickness. It's the biological, it's the emotional, uh, it's the emotion that, that simulator sickness stimulates, creates. And uh, with, uh, but in addition to discuss, it's also phobia. And I thought this was a really brilliant insight by uh, Jed Ashford, who's a uh, lead designer at uh, Sony's Morpheus project. And uh, he's, he's got a whole deck on phobias. So we are creating these worlds that are so real. The sense of immersion is so real that if you have a fear of rickety bridges, you know, he says, well, or heights, uh, you, you actually, when you walk out onto a game, like we put the rickety bridges in all the time over boiling hot lava, it's like, no, you're really scared. You're not just play scared, you're really scared. So what, is it, what are you going to do as a game designer? Make the bridge wider, allow the, uh, the person to jump over it, you know, push back into theater mode to, you know, for the real phobia stuff? Or what if your phobia is simply, people are afraid of all kinds of things. What if it's, you know, you're just simply afraid of someone like yelling at your face? You know, you know you just, you just, if, you're, if someone's yelling at your face really close and that triggers a really bad response, what are you going to do? And how as a game designer are you going to do that? Of course, if you're afraid of zombies, you know, maybe that will trigger, you know, this, uh, <laughs> maybe real fear of zombies or maybe, maybe something else. Um, Disgust can look like this. Uh, this is a beautiful title called Edge of Nowhere from by, by Insomniac. I love the premise. And the motion profile is amazing for VR. The story is just perfect. However, the camera and character uh, for the, and controls for these sections are just a real recipe for uh, uh, vestibular and eye mismatch. Uh, because you are not only not stimulating forward motion, you know, your, your cochlea that goes this way, you're also on the diagonal here. You're also not stimulating the one that goes on the sides. So you're actually kind of doubling up 
on the, the, discuss, uh, the discuss factor, the sim sickness, by doing a diagonal jumping puzzle. A couple of other reasons, too. Whereas this is a little bit more successful VR sports challenge, uh, you still have fast action and motion in other characters, and then you have a role, you have a role to play. So there's a really interesting, you know, this is a really interesting solution. Uh, I'm going to skip over uh, that one. I love Showdown from Epic uh, because it uses, how many people have played this on, uh, in uh, Crescent Bay? Yeah, really cool, isn't it? And it's not, you, you have motion of the camera, and I think that it, it really, we're, we believe that it's uh, related to, you know, if you go into bullet time, my ear does not know what bullet time feels like, so I'm not sick. And then I'm filled with some amazing emotions, and so that also really brings up the, the comfort level. Uh, for that. So avoiding triggering disgust and phobias is a really, really great way. That's kind of a twofer. Let's look at controls to improve uh, game, game experiences. So with the, uh, just like with, the, uh, with like mobile gaming, we, uh, you know, VR has its own set of controls. And so what we're looking at uh, for improving experiences would be simply to uh, provide direct controls that are native to VR. So these native, um, these native controls that are, um, um, uh, are going to be what's more, uh, more interesting. So traditional controls, it's like you don't want to slap a D-pad on a mobile game. That, that feels forced. Likewise, holding controllers in your hand, that's going to feel forced as well. Uh, an example of native controls is this one by Bazaar, by Templegate Games. Uh, it's a VR experience. So here they've got this really innovative nod. So you nod to continue. You know, you do a yes and a no in order to do your gesture. So it's a gesture-based, head-based gesture. I thought that was really, really brilliant for controls. They also have a, um, a, a, a control map, a, a constellation map, a progress map above them in the sky of constellations as you make progress. So that's another way of really bringing that, uh, that environment, you know, the UI, into the world, uh, which is really, really stunning. Uh, so that's, that's controls. And I think we're going to go into the, the second to last one, which is fun. And what we've got here is that we really want to select game mechanics that increase the immersive qualities of the VR experience. So uh, you know, wrapping a old game mechanic around, you know, wrapping a, an old game mechanic with a VR experience isn't going to be nearly as um, compelling as something that's, that's boiled you know, from, from the ground up. And here's kind of, uh, kind of why. Uh, we can be, you know, HoloLens has got some really cool, a lot of experiences have these really cool 5-minute, 10-minute, 20-minute experiences in, inside of them. Uh, but what happens after that time, after that immersion, uh, after that novelty window closes, uh, pretty much every experience uh, has a novelty window about 10 to 20 minutes. Mobile, it's much shorter. It's about you know 30 seconds to two minutes. Uh, the platform needs to offer, or that experience needs to offer some kind of new kind of fun at that at that point. Otherwise, the player is going to leave. Uh, a, a game that's like almost there, uh, just it's heartbreaking. Is I love this game, Anschwar Wars, and they uh, have. Uh, it's really cool to be this ball gunner, you know. And you're in on. Uh, I've played it on the uh, on the Gear VR, and you're in there, and you you can be like that fantasy Star Wars sort of thing. And I'm like shooting at things, which is great. But then after a few minutes, it's like, well, wait, I've kind of played this game before. So they've solved all of these amazing problems. They've got a theme that works for the audience. They've got a, you know, they've got, you know, comfort level down. They've got a great control structure. It's a gay shooter. And then the fun. So we really need to have that kind of fun, that engagement to pull people, um, to pull people through that, that experience, that, that fun factor. I thought uh, the playroom is very, ca very casual, um, but you, it's a two-screen experience. You've got your friends playing the minions. They're running away from Godzilla, and the person with the head-mounted display is Godzilla. And so you're simply moving back and forth, knocking over buildings, which is what you would want to do as Godzilla. And then that, of course, like, makes things fall on your friends, which is also fun. And then the, the game switches at the end, and the friends now throw you, and you have to dodge as Godzilla. Uh, but that is really, it's really those, this game mechanic is designed to pull you into that world. So you you're changing the world, you're moving in that world, you're really becoming part of that world, and that mechanic is putting you into that environment, and that's really key, because ga you know, VR is about immersion, it's about being somewhere else. Being someone else, somewhere else. That's what it's about. Another successful thing that I'd like to see uh, you know, am amplified even more is use the use of 3D. And so here we've got a good start on that with the Source 2 Portal VR demo. Like you, you, know, you have this kind of machine or whatever to you know, manipulate or walk around. And um, 
if you can just amplify that more and add more 3D where it really matters, like what direction I'm looking at or what the 3D you know, nature of things are, then that's a puzzle that could only be solved in VR and makes it a much more native, uh, native experience and much more fun. It'll access new things, new things for people. Uh, so we want to select, that's fun, so we want to select a mechanic that increases the immersive qualities, you know, gets you into that new character, gets you new into that new world. Uh, the last one is about emotion. So we've been talking, we've been a lot, I've been to a lot of the panels today, a lot of stuff about emotion in VR. And uh, emotion for VR, it's really more, that more TV, more television than stage. And if you, have, if you know anything about film history, when movies came out, actors were stage actors and they would play to the back of the house and they would be, you know, big wide gestures and, you know, they'd be like, your audience was 100, 200 feet away, right? But in television or in movies, you know, your audience is really close. So you, you look silly when you do that, right? And so there's a different type of acting for, for film and for television. Likewise for, for VR. But let's go, let's, let, let's ask this expert here, Alfred Hitchcock. So uh, many of you have seen one of his films, I'm sure. Uh, so what was Hitchcock the master of? Was he the master of A, uh, jump scares? Was he the master of fear? Right? Or was he, as I hear in the audience already, suspense, right? So he was the master of suspense, which is that creating in the audience that moment right before fear, right? Before the shower curtain opens, right? Before, oh, it was the cat. You know, some of my favorite movies like Alien, ugh, it's so scary. Uh, but it's because, but you don't see the alien in Alien uh, like until real two. Right? It's all indirect and it's all like, oh my gosh, it's coming, what is it? That is all techniques to emotionally pull you, to pull you in. And that's what we need to do. And so our, our rule here, our guideline for emotion, uh, the one I'd love to share with you here, is in VR, the temptation is to do the opposite. So in VR, I'd love you all to whisper, you know, not yell. As far as use forceps, not chainsaws, in terms of getting people's emotions out, right? I don't mean literally, you know, no chainsaws in movie, in, in that, that's not what I mean, but in terms of the emotional quality, it's tempting to have all of these buttons and then just like, okay, we're going to set all the dials to 11. But then people will put on the headset, you know, get this blast of emotion and then rip it off because it's just too intense and it's just not, you know, it's just not. I mean, if you get jump scared a couple times, you know, if I'm always standing on the edge of a building, always, every game, you know, is I'm always standing on the edge of a building about to fall or I always fall, um, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to opt out of VR experiences. So we want to have these, you know, the ability to go to 10 or 11, or maybe because it's VR we can go to 21, but then we need to bring it back down because uh, biologically we are, we differ, we, we feel the difference of emotion. We feel the motion, uh, any emotion, is the changing of one emotional state to the other, from going from one to the other. So I'd like to uh, just wrap up with a couple of examples of this, of emotion uh, being created through mechanics, and then we might have, a, might have a minute or so for questions. If you want more, you can look at the, uh, download the Four Keys to Fun uh, from the website. Here's something about creating easy fun. So that's the first, the first key. So in the gallery uh, by Six Elements, I mean, sorry, Gallery Six Elements by Cloudhead Games, is that you're creating exploration with this mist-like interaction, right? So you're creating curiosity as you go, and that pulls you in. So you're creating emotion to pull you into that world. Super important. Uh, in our game, Follow the White Rabbit, you know, you, you find this, this magic painting. This is not a rabbit. What does that mean? Wait, it is a rabbit. No, it's not. Wait, what is, you know, that curiosity that, that we're using a lot of surrealistic techniques in, in this particular game to pull and increase immersion. Uh, you want to reward close observation. So this is actually a spoiler. And uh, I'm going to move on, but it is actually a spoiler because you actually have quite a few of the clues in this, in this, in this, in this view. And then you have, uh, for all of the keys, you have these controls. I'm not going to review them all because uh, of time, but you have these micro loops for easy fun. So controls, creativity, exploration, and fantasy, using these techniques can create emotion to pull people into those, into those scenes. Uh, if you want people to play beyond the novelty window, you need some hard fun. So here are some puzzles, uh, you know, that this is in Follow the White Rabbit. Uh, you also want to have social design. So we've talked a lot about how can we make VR experiences more social. Why are we doing that? It's because it's such a powerful source of emotion. This is Steam Crew, uh, which was an, uh, an Oculus uh, game jam. It's a uh, two-person uh, submarine, so one person steers, one person, you know, does the other stuff. 
and you have to do it's all over, um, you know, it's all over um, a Wi-Fi or you know or Bluetooth. Uh, AR experiences like cast AR, I really love this because there's face-to-face -face contact, and so you're getting tons of emotion uh, by you know tons of emotion by you know having other people to play with, you know to look back and back and forth, and then you can also have a uh, narrative using. Um, Mysteries really aren't about who did it. They're not about the weapon, you know, it was the, the candlestick in the drawing room with Cur it is, or Colonel Mustard. It's really, mysteries are about finding out the relationships. And like Michael Eisner was saying yesterday, it's, you know, one of the, it's, you know, it's plot and story, and it's also human relationships. So being sure that our worlds are full of human relationships or animal relationships or some way, those emotions are very strong. There's more emotion in what we call people fun than the other three keys uh, combined. Uh, lastly, I'd like to, as a last example, is to talk about Z-Space. Um, how many people have seen Z-Space? What I really like about it is it's, uh, you, you wear a very light pair, lightweight pair of um, uh, polarized lenses, and you can do it side by side, and we can both see, because it's on a Cintiq-like display, and the image comes out. It's really hard to explain how that's different than putting on VR headset, but it's, it, come, it projects out like a pop-up book. And then you have a wand, and you have it with haptics, and you can you can reach into the scene, you know, the 3D vapor, right? You can reach inside and move and feel inside of that thing. It's really fascinating. Very good for learning, very good for anatomy and other sorts of things. So that's, that's serious fun. And it's creating those emotions of, uh, of learning, which is, which is great. So there you have it. Um, we've got five VR design strategies. You know, these are high-level strategies for better uh, VR games. So we want to match uh, the audience and the platform create more comfort by avoiding triggers for disgust and uh, phobias. And if we trigger disgust in the story, we may add, enhance the disgust we're feeling from the wearing the goggles. So that's what, you know, that's what I'm looking at there. You want to be very careful with the emotion, disgust emotion. And then uh, we want to also create, uh, you know, provide direct native controls for VR. And then carefully select the type of game to enhance the immersion uh, into that scene. So for the fun factor, use something that really pulls them into that world and into that environment. And for emotion, of course, uh, you know, whisper, you know, don't, don't yell. Uh, so that's all I have um, time. If you, like, if you like this sort of topic and you happen to be interested in going to uh, South by Southwest, uh, we have a panel. The panel picker is open. So myself, Brianna Wee, and Kent Bai are going to talk more about the subject. And um, the next time you want to ask this question in a VR, VR game, like where's the, where's the fun, feel free to uh, reach out and these slides will, will, be, uh, will be available. Feel free to bring me a card afterward if you'd like to know more about the um, other 36, um, or I guess 31 uh, types of fun. So thank, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nicole. We have time for one question. And I saw your hand go up first. Uh, hi, Nicole. I'm Trey. Hi, Trey. Oh, hi. Hey. Um, so as we kind of enter the next two to five years of VR, we're going to have a huge install base issue. So my question for you was, what do you think is the significance of asymmetrical gameplay for developers, in particular for publishers, um, in terms of kind of solving that, that uh, install uh, as issue? Asymmetrical or asynchronous? Asymmetrical. Asymmetrical gameplay. As in VR players and non-VR players in the oh, same right, space. Oh, right, you got to, right. Yeah. I think that that's going to be, I think that there's going to be some significant advantages to doing that as long as the asymmetrical gameplay doesn't require additional hardware. Mm -hmm. And then I think that going, there's a really interesting uh, going, you know, between being able to just go play on my device, play on my VR, play on my, my console. I think that that's going to be a really, uh, a really, really big trend. First, we've got to get some stuff that actually people can play for more than, how many people have played for more than, uh, a v, one VR experience for more than five minutes? Okay, and then, uh, then 10, 30, an hour? Oh wow, yeah, of course. <laughs> and these are the developers in the room? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But by and large, you know, consumer grade stuff is only like five minutes, you know, and then I'm like, okay, I'm done. So we need to get a lot more in so we can actually go. Uh, the one, uh, one of the many um, things that are lurking out there in the world, uh, one of the, the, the memes that are, that's very dangerous is the social one. We definitely need more social you know, interaction in games. Um, but there's this uh, assumption is that I'm going to, you know, that Skype on video conferencing on headset is going to be amazing. 
And it only works if it's kind of one way. So if I want to, if I want to like attend Noah's talk and I can't be there, right? You know, and then I, I so I put on my head-mounted display and wow, I've got Noah in 3D. That's great. But Noah can't see me in 3D unless he puts his headset on. And then if he puts his headset on, then now I've got an avatar situation, right? And then we're looking at avatars in 3D space, and that's kind of cool. And that's like wow in 3D, and that's that's fun. But that sense of presence, I think you have to be really careful and think through what, what social, when you're on multiple screens, like with the Godzilla one. When I'm uh, playing Godzilla, I can't see my friends at all. And so that there's a real, that's really, if I'm playing blind like that, that's actually a real, a real problem because it's a missed opportunity, right? And so that really cutting down, um, I think some people will solve it by having, going, doing a very gradual AR to VR, you know, moving in and out of the camera, how opaque that, that display is. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Nicole. One last uh, round of applause. All right, thank you.